Are, are we starting soon, Vincent, or what? what? Well, we, we've technically already started. So we oh, have, did we? Uh, okay. We have about 28 attendees in the chat right now. Okay. And uh, we have folks slowly filtering in. Uh, I'm thinking we'll play our intro video and then we'll uh, just get right into it. Okay, Vincent, can I ask you, are you going to talk about Ted's book? That um, information? You know what, uh, you know, Susan, how about we leave that with you during the introduction? Okay, I am mentioning it in the introduction, but there's more about about it as well, but we'll just, that's okay. I got good. it. All right. So hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our first speaker of the season. My name is Vincent St. Pierre. I'm the membership chair for the Canadian Club of Calgary. Uh, so let's do some quick housekeeping before we begin. Uh, thing number one, we're on Zoom. Uh, this is our chosen platform for the, uh, the series uh, for at least the beginning part of the season as we work through COVID-19. So you'll note there's several different options on your screen. Uh, depending on if you're on, say, uh, you know, a mobile phone, PC, iMac, or if you're on the Chrome version of Zoom, there's going to be different placements for most of the buttons. But I'm going to highlight two important buttons. Right at the bottom, if you're on a desktop, or right at the top, if you're on the mobile, there are the Q&A function and the chat function. We'll be having a Q&A section later. So I hope you will... Uh, uh, I hope you will uh, take advantage of that. You can also send a chat message to all the panelists right at the bottom. So one moment, I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint slide. Okay, good morning and welcome to our first Canadian Club uh, Zoom luncheon. Uh, I would like to start with our reflection. Uh, this was written in 1869 and uh, I think it could have a lot of value today. And people stayed home and read books and listened and they exercised and they rested and made art and played and learned new ways of being and stopped and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some met their shadow and people began to think differently and people healed. And in the absence of people who lived in ignorant ways, dangerous, meaningless, and heartless, the earth also began to heal. And when the danger ended and people found themselves, they grieved for the dead and made new choices and dreamed of new visions and created new ways of living and completely healed the earth just as they were healed. Thank you. That was from 1869 and it can be relevant today. Thank you. And I think I'm going right into this. Yes. Okay, good morning and welcome to the Calgary Canadian Club. This, as you know, is the first of our fall speaker series 2020 using a Zoom delivery. I'd also like to thank and extend a welcome to all the people from other Canadian clubs that are joining us in our first uh, virtual presentation. I think we are hearing from people from Vancouver, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Toronto. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. 
My name is Susan Jolliffe and I'm co-chair of the speaker committee for the Canadian Club of Calgary. And I'm pleased to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Ted Morton, on the topic, Alberta at a crossroads, the status quo must go. Dr. Morton received his BA from the University of Colorado and his MA and PhD from the University of Toronto. In 1981, he arrived at the University of Calgary as a member of the political science department. Long described as a part of the Calgary School, Dr. Morton has had a tremendous impact on the politics of our province and country. In 2004, Dr. Mark, Mark I'm sorry, Morton extended uh, his influence into political politics as a conservative MLA for the Foothills Rocky View area. In 2006, he was Minister of Sustainable Resource Development. Then in 2008 or 2011, Energy Minister and also in there he was Finance Minister. Presently, he serves as a Professor Emeritus at the Political Science Department at the University of Calgary. His new book, which he'll be discussing today, Moment of Truth, how to think about Alberta's future with co-editors Jack Mintz and Tom Flanagan. They have examined the options for Alberta's future, suggesting that it is time for a new strategy. To quote, Alberta may need to go halfway down a road to be a distinct to a destination that they don't want to get the policy and the constitutional changes necessary to stay in the Canada that we love. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ted Morton. Am I on, Vince? You are on. We are live, Dr. Okay. Morton. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Susan. Uh, thank you, Vince, for uh, putting this together. So far, so good. Uh, I'm happy to be, uh, happy to be with uh, the Canadian Club today. Um, I'm going to begin by trying to explain what I think is uh, Alberta's disadvantaged situation in Confederation, not in a partisan way, but more as a, as, as a political scientist. And I'm going to suggest to you that um, where we are today is pre predictable consequence between a misalignment of our constitution and our economy. Uh, I, to, to be a bit simplistic, but to the point, we still have a 19th century constitution and a 21st century economy which no longer match and no longer work. And the result has been a, a systematic, not a political, but a sy systemic disadvantaging of Western Canada in recent politics. And particularly in the last decade, the pipeline politics uh, has brought us not just to a disadvantage, but in my view, in the view of my co-authors, uh, Tom Flanagan and Jack Mintz, really the very future of Alberta and by extension, Western Canada. So, I'll begin by, again, playing the political scientist. I, I don't want to make this the blame game. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that where we're at is a function of the intersection of, of four factors. And these are our electoral system, Canadian demographics, Canadian geology, and our evolving economy. Our electoral system. Uh, we have rep by pop in the House of Commons, uh, and there's no corresponding second chamber, a Senate, which represents or protects the interest of the less populated Western and Atlantic provinces. If we had a Senate, like Australia, like the US, like Germany, like other large federations, there would be a, an arena, a voice for the less populated provinces in developing national policy. We don't have that. We just have Parliament, House of Commons with the rep by pop. Secondly, demographics. 60% of Canadians live in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, together, they have 198 seats in the House of Commons, uh, and you only need 170 MPs to form a majority. So basically, you can form majority governments in Ottawa, in Canada, with virtually no representation from any provinces from Manitoba West. Now, again, if every province had more or less the same, the same uh, uh, population, two, three, four million, this wouldn't be a problem, but we don't have that. And finally, uh, geology, 90% of Canada's oil and gas production comes from Alberta and Saskatchewan. That makes us economically very different than Ontario and Quebec, 
or to put it differently, if Ontario and Quebec had significant oil and gas interests, uh, the problem would probably be solved because there would be a greater alignment of the economic interests of Central Canada and Western Canada. That's the third factor. And then fourth, the evolving economy. Uh, Canada today is not just completely different than the Canada of 1867, but even the Canada at the end of World War II. At the end of World War II, um, the population of BC and Alberta, Alberta combined was half of that, half of Quebec's. Today, there are one million more people in Alberta and, and BC than in Quebec. Economically, the change is even greater. Again, at the end of World War II, the economies, combined economies of Alberta and BC were half that of Quebec. Today, they're 50% greater. Uh, and there's also, in addition to that quantitative change, there's been a qualitative change. Historically, as we all learned in, uh, in high school and maybe college or university when you started, in the, in the old Canada, most trade was on an east-west axis. That's why building the railroads was such an important national undertaking. Today, that old economy has been replaced by a north-south economy. I think these statistics will startle many of you. Today, every province except Manitoba trades exports more to the United States than it does to any to the entire rest of Canada. And collectively, uh, collectively, our exports to the United States are 50% more than our exports to each other. So there's not just been a quantitative change in our economy, but a qualitative change. So again, we have a constitution that's framed on how Canada was in 1867, and we have a, 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 an economic and social reality today that's completely misaligned with that constitution. So where do we, where do we begin? I'm sure all of you think I'm going to take us right to Quebec. I'm not. Let's, let's go to Italy and Spain to begin. Great places. I'm sure many of you have been there. Uh, in the time of COVID, I guess we can't go there, but we all hope to go there again. Why do I want to take you to Italy and Spain? Well, in addition to being beautiful, they also have an interesting parallel to what's happened in Canada in the last 50 years. National governments in both Spain and Italy have routinely raided the treasuries of the demographically small but economically wealthier regions to win national elections. In, in, in Italy, that means the area of <clears throat> around in Northern Italy, which is much wealthier but less, less populous than Rome and places south of Rome. And in, 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 uh, in Spain, it's the governments, the central governments in Madrid going after the greater wealth around Barcelona in the area called Catalonia. And not surprisingly, the voters and the taxpayers in those two regions have both fought back. They formed separatist parties in both Northern Italy and Catalonia. They've held referendums to acquire more regional autonomy and even to secede. And in both countries, these referendums have won strong majorities. So you can see there's an interesting parallel between the politics of those two countries and what's happened in Canada. And I suggest that this, these are national variations on a more general theme. And that is, this is sort of hardball politics. You can win elections by promising to give a majority of voters something for nothing. In other words, instead of, but instead of targeting wealthier individuals in big business, who are always a minority of voters, you target wealthier regions, which also have a minority of voters. And that's how national parties can seek and succeed in winning national elections. Uh, I'll have a, a quotation, the uh, Catalan independence movement, so this is in Barcelona in Spain, uh, one of their slogans in the last referendum to secede, which they won, they haven't seceded, but they won the referendum, their campaign slogan was, Spain is robbing us, Spain is robbing us. And that should sound familiar uh, to many of you, uh, because something similar has been going on between Alberta and Ottawa. Uh, in the last five decades. Um, okay, we say reluctantly goodbye to Italy and Spain. We come back to Canada. Let's start with Alberta. I'll get to Quebec, don't worry, but we'll start with Alberta. So here are the simple figures from uh, Statistics Canada. Uh, these are government figures about economic transfers out of, out of Alberta since 1961. 
the total figure since 1961 is $630 billion. $630 billion. You know, what, what does that mean? Let's get more current. Just since 2000, just since the millennium, uh, the average transfer, net transfer, everything that all the money that leaves Alberta and goes to Ottawa, minus the money that comes from Ottawa, federal types of spending transfers back, the net difference has averaged $20 billion a year. Now, again, some of, you know, what, what is $20 billion? Well, the government of Alberta budget for the last couple of years has been in the vicinity of $50 billion. So $20 billion is almost 40% of the government budget. Or to give you another figure to give some context, in uh, 2018, the uh, Alberta had a deficit, uh, a deficit of seven billion, but there were 17 billion dollars that net left Alberta and went to Ottawa for redistribution. So you can see these are big, big numbers in terms of how they affect not just the government of Alberta, but all Albertans. And again, I would suggest to you that this is a Canadian variation on the broader theme that you can win elections by moving wealth from voter poor, resource rich regions, Western Canada, to voter rich, resource poor regions, Central Canada, and specifically Quebec. Now, Ontario, obviously key, but Quebec, in some ways, almost more important because of the national unity issue and, and the issue of Quebec separatism for the last several decades. Uh, some of you who are as old as I am might remember that this strategy sounds complicated. It can be stated very simply. Keith Davey, who was Pierre Trudeau's uh, campaign manager in, in 1980, put it this way. This was off the record, but it's verified. He is said to have said, and it's repeated, screw the West, we'll take the rest. Screw the West, we'll take the rest. And of course they did. Uh, and they brought in the national energy policy. And again, those of you who are my age can remember the economic devastation that had. So this electoral strategy worked for Trudeau in 19, Father Trudeau, Pierre in 1980, and I would suggest it's worked for Justin. Uh, it worked for Justin in the 2015 election, and maybe slightly less effectively in the uh, 2019 election where he, he got a minority government rather than a majority government. Uh, again, some of you who are as old as I am might remember a professor at McGill named J.R. Mallory. When I was a graduate student uh, a long time ago, he was sort of the, uh, the great authority on Canadian constitutional matters. And he wrote, he said that historically, uh, Federation had two different, two different levels. There was Ontario and Quebec had a status and autonomy that were different, i.e. much better, higher than the rest of the provinces. The other provinces, Mallory wrote were uh, provinces in the Roman sense. In other words, they existed to somehow support the two important provinces. And he said, even though this inequality might appear, uh, might appear uh, unfair or irrational, he said it wasn't. He said it made sense because, quote, it recognizes so far what have been the economic realities of this country. The econ and that was the economic realities down through World War II. Today, it's not. It's not 1867 anymore. It's not 1945. It's 2000, 2020. Uh, and today's economic reality has changed, but Canada's constitution has not changed. And Alberta has been, and Western Canada more generally, has been uh, structurally vulnerable then for that type of politics of transferring money, large, very significant amounts of money from the West to Central Canada. So um, now this isn't the first time that uh, West, Western Canada has argued strongly for a, a fair deal. Uh, again, uh, if you know a little bit of Alberta history, Peter Lougheed fought a determined battle with uh, Pierre Drew Trudeau and won a number of battles. I'll refer to those in a minute. In the 70s and, and 80s, we had Preston Manning with the Reform Party, the West wants in, again, some important initial victories. And then of course we had Stephen Harper, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada for almost a decade from Alberta and obviously sympathetic to Alberta and Western interest. In the chapter I've written for the book, which has been referenced, I go through uh, uh, about a dozen different policies which document how in case after case, we're actually worse off today than we were 30 
uh, Alberta is worse off today than we were 30 years ago. I don't want to use the short amount of time we have the, today to go through all of those. I've talked about the size of the, of the fiscal transfers already. I'll mention a couple of others just very quickly. Senate reform. Some of you might remember I was very involved in the Senate reform effort back in the 90s and early 2000s with Burt Brown. And you know, we were getting senator, elected senators were being appointed. Today, Senate reform is, is dead in the water, killed by a Supreme Court decision uh, in 2014. Uh, the restoration, Quebec has now a constitutional veto. Uh, the Regional Veto Act passed by a liberal government in the late 1990s gave back to Quebec one of Peter Lougheed's biggest victories, the amending formula in 1982, the equality of the provinces. Quebec and Ontario were not given any special vetoes and it, it created a more level playing field, at least in terms of any constitutional amendments. Uh, veto has been given back to Quebec uh, by federal legislation. Uh, the Supreme Court and charter rulings has eroded uh, provincial rights and federalism. Federalism, if you think about it, accommodates a certain type of diversity. You know, different provinces have different economies, different ethnic mixes, different climates, different everything. And federalism recognizes that and allows for a large amount of local regional self-government. Charter of rights is different. Charter of rights is one size fits all. So there's a natural tension between those two. And the Supreme Court has been very uh, uh, aggressive or certainly energetic in exercising its veto power over provincial statutes. Um, Last but not least, of course, has been uh, the pipeline politics of the last decade, uh, the costly delays in Trans Mountain and coastal gas, the Trudeau vetoes of Northern Gateway and Energy East, uh, judicial, misinterpret judicial misinterpretation of Section 35, the Aboriginal Rights Section of the Constitution, one of Peter, big, biggest, one of Peter Lougheed's biggest victories in the constitutional negotiations in 81, 82 was Section 35, that it protected existing Aboriginal rights, not some abstract notion of Aboriginal rights, existing Aboriginal rights, the status quo. But the court has ignored that, instead read, read in the duty to consult. The words duty to consult don't even appear in section 35. Anyhow, that then has fueled and led to this totally unprecedented coalition, the, the coalition that uh, uses litigation, uh, lawfare, to delay and you know, all of you who are in the business world know time is money and delay cost uh, to, to defeat the building of new pipelines uh, in, in, uh, in Canada. And this death by delay strategy, even more troubling, has been large amounts of funding coming in from outside of Canada, mainly the United States. And again, the Trudeau government doing virtually nothing about it because it fits into what uh, their uh, energy slash environment climate change policy has been. The result has been, and again, everybody in Alberta feel, that doesn't just know this, we see it, we feel it, you can see it on the streets, you can see it downtown, the collapse of the Alberta economy. Now, oil and gas prices collapsed because of market reasons in 2014, 2015, but then there was a recovery uh, until COVID came. And from 2016 up until February of this year, all of the oil and gas economies in the states south of us were, did very, very well, whereas again, we know in Alberta, there's been a complete collapse and an exodus of capital. Uh, not only have all the American companies left, even the Canadian companies have left. Uh, TransCanada has taken Canada out of its name. It's now TC Energy. In Canada, you, in Canada used to be the largest uh, and Cana largest Canadian-owned uh, energy company uh, in Canada. Now it's called it calls itself Oventive. It, and it's headquartered in, in Denver. You, you never even know the Canadian connection. So the companies that have survived, uh, and this is true for lots of the service companies too, have moved their investment in their business south of the border in order to keep going. Those who haven't gone a lot of them out of business, resulting in unemployment that you're all familiar with. Okay, we're back in Canada. That's Alberta. Quickly on Quebec. Uh, I won't go through the details here. Let me just say the weaker Quebec has become economically, which I've walked you through already, the more powerful it's become politically. And of course, you all know why. The, the separation threat, the separatism threat of René Levesque and the separatist party in Quebec has uh, basically been the single most enduring dominant issue of national politics in my adult lifetime from the, from the 70s on. Uh, they've been the beneficiary of, while Alberta has watched $630 billion leave the province, 
Quebec has been on the receiving end to the tune of $497 billion. $497 billion in, in transfer, equalization and transfers since 1961. Um, today, in today's world, two out of every three dollars of the equalization program, which has a budget of about 19 or $20 billion, two out of every three dollars go to Quebec. Is this just by coincidence? No. It, 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 it taps into uh, the view that no price is, particularly for the Liberal Party, that no price is too high to keep Quebec in, in separation to defeat, to defeat the separatists. Um, and we've seen this in national politics. We've had Liberal governments for four of the last six decades. You know, think of all Prime Ministers, again, in my adult lifetime, uh, Trudeau, Mulroney, Chrétien, another Trudeau, with the exception of, uh, of Harper and, you know, six months for Joe Clark, everybody is from Quebec. Alberta's fate has been just the opposite. The more we've contributed, which I've documented for you already and is documented in the book, the more we contribute, <laughs> the less we've received. We've become uh, politically more and more marginalized. So that's the status quo. That's the direction we're headed in, documented in the book. So what's the path forward? In the book, uh, we identify three options. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'll call one is more Alberta in Ottawa. Secondly, less Ottawa in Alberta. And then third, of course, separation. The first preference, more Alberta in Ottawa, are reforms that would give Alberta and the West, and actually Atlantic Canada as well, more influence in the policy process in, in Ottawa. First and foremost, of course, would be some sort of meaningful Triple E Senate reform, equal, effective, and elected. Uh, Supreme Court reforms. Quebec and Ontario have uh, guaranteed seats on the Supreme Court. No other provinces do. Um, and again, Supreme Court justices are chosen by the Prime Minister and the Justice Minister. Uh, why shouldn't they be chosen by, by provincial premiers uh, in order to represent, get that diversity of regional, regional views and regional interests in the discussions around the interpretation, both of, of federalism cases and charter cases. Uh, those would, that would be our first choice. Uh, also a, a national C2C2C a national to -C -to -C infrastructure corridor. As far as Senate reform and the Supreme Court goes, we don't think any of those are likely to happen. Again, for because of Supreme Court decisions that I won't go into, the Supreme Court has basically constitutionalized reforms to either the court or to the Senate and has made piecemeal reforms, the type that Stephen Harper was trying to do uh, as prime minister back uh, five or six years ago. It, he, it's made those impossible. Now you have to have a constitutional amendment to change the court or the Senate. Quebec has a veto. It's not going to happen. So our first preference, getting increasing the influence of Alberta and other provinces in, in Ontario, we don't think see as realistic. Our last preference, our least favorable one, is separation. But you, you must remember that because of the Supreme Court decision in the 1998 Quebec secession reference, and then the Clarity Act, the piece of legislation passed by the Chrétien government after the Supreme Court decision, does create a pathway to legal secession. It was created, I think, with Quebec in mind, but it's there for any province. Um, we think that possibility is possible in theory, problematic in practice. Uh, we, I think it's obvious there would be multiple short-term risks, great political instability, uh, investor lack of investor confidence in Canada. Some of us remember what the constitutional politics of the 1990s were like uh, when our dollar was worth, when it went down to 61 cents, the so-called Northern peso. Uh, not good for Alberta, not good for Canada. Um, and also, each of the authors, uh, myself included, are proud of Canada's history, proud of Canada's achievements. And we agree with Peter Lougheed, a strong Alberta makes for a strong Canada. Um, so that's why separation is our last, our least preferred, but we don't rule it out. We don't rule it out. And one of the contributors, one of the contributors to the book, Derek Burney, some of you might remember Derek Burney. He was our ambassador to the United States uh, in, the 19, in the 1980s. Uh, and he's continued to play a pivotal role in Canada-U.S. trade issues and, uh, since then. Derek Burney, in the contribution to our book, states something, states this, 
The only way Alberta can grow and prosper economically is through the continued development of its energy and related industries. And if it can't do this under the federal root system, Albertans will be obliged to look at an alternative regime, end of quote. And this is all really about pipelines and getting economically competitive access to global markets and global prices. Without that, the policy-induced recession of the last four years will become permanent. And Alberta uh, will, will not just not grow, it'll shrink. And both Calgary and Edmonton run the risk of becoming 21st versions of Winnipeg, uh, cities that the economy has left behind. Uh, certainly for us, and we think for most Albertans, that option is not acceptable. Or that future is not acceptable. So our recommendation then is option two, more Alberta, less Ottawa. In other words, reducing Alberta's in, Ottawa's influence in Alberta by the government of Alberta taking over a lot of the programs that are currently run by the federal government and having them run by the government of Alberta in Alberta for Albertans. And you'll recognize these because uh, most of these are in Jason Kenney's so-called fair deal or Alberta agenda uh, list of reforms that he announced last year. So this is moving out of the Canada Pension Plan for an Alberta Pension Plan, ending our contract with the RCMP and doing a provincial police force, uh, taking over the collection of personal income tax. Alberta collects our own corporate income tax already, so we extend that to create the collection of personal income tax. Use the Section 33 with not, notwithstanding clause when Supreme Court decisions cancel policies that Albertans and the Alberta government support. Uh, Peter Lougheed fought very hard uh, for the Section 33 notwithstanding clause, it would be very appropriate for an Alberta government not to be reluctant to use that when Supreme Court decisions are clearly contrary to the interests or the wishes of Albertans. Now, three points about these reforms, the, the, the uh, Alberta agenda, the fair deal. None of them are radical or unconstitutional. Ontario and Quebec do each of them already, or one or both of, of, of them each already. Um, they would decrease the influence of the federal government of Ottawa in the lives of Alberta. And each can be done unilaterally. Uh, each of those can be done, can be done unilaterally uh, without the consent of Ottawa or other provinces. So they're, they're doable. They're not radical. They're being done by Ontario or Quebec already, and they can be done unilaterally. Now, we acknowledge, we acknowledge that these reforms may not, may not, reduce the systemic vulnerability that I've described in the first part of my talk today. But we think the alternative of just continuing down the same path, the status quo, the, the risks there are much, much worse, as I've explained. And we think these reforms would create a certain amount of leverage, the leverage that Alberta needs to persuade the rest of Canada, particularly Ontario, uh, Ontario, that uh, to take the threat of Western separatism seriously. Uh, we've, been, we've been making the case to Ontario and the rest of Canada for fairness uh, and reason for the last 30 years. That, poly, that strategy has not worked. I think there has to be, if you like, a real politique uh, that, that if you don't address these issues that threaten Alberta's future, we will take matters into our own hands. Okay, three, three thoughts to uh, end with. Uh, and, er, to leave you with and, and, and to think about. First, if Quebec had been treated the way Alberta has been treated, they would have separated long ago. There's no question about that. Perhaps more importantly, if Alberta had the opportunity, if we had the opportunity to renegotiate the terms of our current association with Canada, we would never agree to the current terms with the $20 billion a year prior to this year, $20 billion a year net flowing to Ottawa to redistribute to other provinces, and especially to Quebec. Now, this does not mean that Western Canada should secede, but it does mean making the rest of Canada understand uh, that for Alberta, and really I think it's all of Western Canada, the status quo is just as unacceptable. Uh, and there's lots of room between these two extremes, uh, but between the status quo and separation to get a fair, more balanced deal for Alberta and Western Canada. I'd end with, I've already said once, Peter Lougheed used to say, a strong Alberta makes for a strong Canada. Canada without Alberta would be much weaker, but Alberta without Canada would be weaker too. So 
but I think it's up to the next generation of leaders. And I'm, <clears throat> I've checked out, I'm retired now, uh, to take these issues seriously, uh, challenge the status quo, and work for a new and better and more fair deal uh, for Alberta and all of Western Canada. Thank you. That's, that's it, Vince. You caught me off. And I hear Dr. Oh, so just give me one moment. I have to uh, bring our President German onto the chat. And Hello, everyone. Perfect. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this event. Thank you, to Ted Morton and Dr. Morton, for the for highlighting the risks of continuing down the the current path. It was an awesome speech that probably was an eye-opening event for everyone who participated. We hope that your talk today has inspired some conversations on the Zoom call. Now that we're um, able to, we're gonna open up the floor for some questions and answers. So I'll pass it off to Vincent, our membership chair, to help facilitate and also help explain how this is gonna work. Hi everybody, my name is Vincent. Uh, let's, let's go forward with some housekeeping. Uh, same as before, as uh, the uh, as previously mentioned at the beginning of this session, we're doing a Q&A. So we've had some submitted questions. We've had uh, some folks come through the chat. The preference is to send in your question through the Q&A feature on Zoom so we can, so we make sure we don't miss anybody. And, uh, but before we get to that, um, and as folks fill in their questions, um, I have some pre-prepared ones. So Dr. Morton, you have a book on sale. You know, as mentioned earlier, you're announcing publication of your latest book. Where can we find this book should we want to purchase it? Okay, well, you can save yourself some money, first of all, probably by reading some of the excerpts out of it that have been published in the National Post, I think, uh, starting on last weekend and then again yesterday and again today. So you can, I think, if you can get on Google, you can find some of that and see if you even want to read it. But if you are, if you are interested, um, it's being published by Sutherland House Books. Uh, it's a new publishing house in Canada. Ken White, you might remember Ken White. He was the founding editor of the National Post back in the 90s. Uh, yeah, there it is, Sutherland House Publications. Um, I think he went on to be the editor at Maclean's and uh, several other uh, Canadian magazines. And now he started his own, his own uh, uh, publishing house uh, in, in Toronto. And so there is the, uh, or just Google Sutherland, Sutherland uh, House Books and you can order it there. Or I've been told it's available at Indigo uh, bookstores as well. Fantastic. So Dr. Morton, uh, as we get more questions added in, uh, we haven't, so you're, you're speaking to the Canadian club. It's, we happen to be fans of Canada and keeping it whole. And throughout your entire presentation, you highlighted multiple options and discussion items for Alberta and its place in Confederation. Uh, even on the cover of the book is an inclusion of becoming USA's 51st state or going it alone. With all this considered, does your book advocate for separatism? Uh, abs absolutely not. Uh, as I tried to say in my remarks, we leave that, we identify both the opportunities and risk associated with separatism. Uh, I tried to highlight in my remarks today uh, the risk. There are opportunities. Uh, energy security, energy self-sufficiency is an important issue to the United States and frankly all modern industrial democracies. So it's not as the world needs more oil. Uh, we'll continue to need more oil uh, notwithstanding the push to reduce use of oil and Alberta has the third largest reserves in the world. So there are options going forward, but we're very clear that that, uh, that is not our preferred option, uh, that both Alberta is better off in Canada and Canada is better off with a strong Alberta, but the terms of the relationship, and particularly the, the, the attack on Alberta's ability to develop that oil and gas and get it to global markets at global prices, which means new pipelines, uh, that has to be addressed. Otherwise, as I said, uh, I don't mean to be nasty to the people in Winnipeg, but everyone who's been to Winnipeg has seen a city that was once vital and strong and a center of, of uh, this well, the center of the Western Canadian economy, and now has just kind of been left on the sidelines. That could happen, 
at uh, Calgary and Edmonton if we continue down the path we're on right now. So my apologies to some of our members in Winnipeg. Uh. <laughs> but but, it, but it, I, again, I, I have, I could, I could name half a dozen good friends in Calgary right now that came to Winnipeg, uh, came to Calgary because they didn't see their future there. When I was a graduate student at U of T, it seemed like every other student was from Winnipeg. I said, why are you all here? They said, well, we, we, can't, we can't stay. There's nothing for us to do in Winnipeg. So again, my apologies there, but it's, we don't want that for Calgary or Edmonton. So Ted, we'll take our first uh, member question. It's from Clint Dawkin. Uh, thanks, Ted. Always enjoy your talks. My question is, considering the equalization issue, what consideration should be given to the pre-1961 situation? Uh, Clint, hi, haven't seen you for a long time. Uh, you always ask difficult questions and I'm not sure exactly what's meant by the pre-1961 situation. I would assume uh, it's pre-oil um, expansion and pre-oil sands development. Well, if, if the, the, quint, the timing of all this is not coincidental. Uh, we all know that Leduc uh, number one, 1947, in one decade, Alberta went from being the poorest province in Canada to a more self-sufficient and, and by the 1970s, 1980s, the wealthiest province in Canada. And it's, it's you know, dri been driven by oil and gas production. And so that has certainly benefited Albertans. Uh, I would never have ended up in Calgary. M most of our friends in, in, in uh, many of our friends in Calgary would never have ended without that tremendous economic growth uh, that, that drove. But uh, as I've tried to summarize today and is documented quite clearly in the book, uh, that coincides then with a more and more aggressive uh, use by Ottawa and specifically the Liberal Party to, through various different taxation regimes and policies, move money out of Alberta for redistribution in so-called have-not provinces, but most specifically Quebec because of the priority for the Liberal Party. Uh, that n no cost is too high to keep Quebec in confederation. And I think I'm one of a growing number of people who aren't willing to accept that, uh, particularly if it means the destruction of Alberta's future. And, I, and I, don't, I don't think we should have to pay Quebec to stay in Canada. Uh, that, to me, that no longer makes sense. So, thank you, Dr. Morton. I, I, I doubt that answers Clint's question, but it's the best I can do. Well, Clint, if it doesn't, uh, feel free to uh, send us an email afterwards and we'll chat with Dr. Morton and get you a more fulsome answer. Uh, next question is from Michelle Scannell. Uh, do you still think it is a good idea to change the police force oversight to Alberta, considering what happened in Red Deer? I assume she's raising the issue with the anti-racism and the anti-demonstrators that came through Red Deer over the weekend. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was terrible. Uh, and more and and uh, kudos to our new justice minister and to the premier, who have both very strongly denounced that and said it's unacceptable. It's not acceptable to Albertans. Uh, so I think uh, a response from Alberta police force that re that reported to uh, Ottawa would, to to Edmonton would be just as strong as as uh, a, the RCMP response. And I'm. I've spent a lot of time in rural Alberta. I had lots of friends and, and political supporters in rural Alberta, and they have not been well served by the RCMP. Uh, if you serve in the RCMP, uh, first of all, to advance, you have to become bilingual, that most Western Canadians aren't. And almost as important, you have to be willing to move around. And there are an awful lot of young men and women in Alberta that would be happy to be uh, in the RCMP, to be policemen and police women, if they could stay in Alberta. But under the RCMP, you have to be willing to, to, to be moved around. Uh, and a, an Alberta police force, I think, would open up a lot of opportunity uh, for young uh, Alberta men and women who are interested in law enforcement, but who want to stay in Alberta. And they would be people that are connected to their communities, I think, provide a, a more effective and more understanding type of police and law enforcement than we get from the RCMP. So, uh 
Another question is from uh, William Kaufman. He's asked it in two separate questions. Uh, I'm going to assume it's one larger question. Um, I suspect that should Alberta take on pension, tax gathering, police force, that uh, nothing will change. I doubt that this would create leverage. We are landlocked and the East knows it. Ted, why do you think the so-called leverage will change anything? Alberta is landlocked and the East knows this question mark. Good, ex excellent question. And I'm happy to, to uh, re report that that very question is addressed at length uh, in the book, uh, in a chapter of the book, the chapter written by Jack Mintz. And again, I think most of uh, today's participants recognize Jack Mintz, um, very senior treasury, uh, uh, born in Alberta, raised in Edmonton, but went on to be one of the most important uh, people in the federal finance department, uh, then uh, in uh, Toronto, uh, head of the biggest economic policy think tank. So, and then Jack, of course, came back to Alberta about a decade and a half ago to start the School of Public Policy. So Jack is a man who has lived uh, all across Canada and who, again, consults and travels uh, globally. Uh, and his chapter documents very clearly that the landlock argument really doesn't hold that much water. There are a number of very, very affluent countries, uh, some of them in Eastern Europe, Switzerland, um, that are landlocked as well. And given uh, trade arrangements, regional trade, regional trade arrangements uh, do very well notwithstanding that. And again, particularly on the oil and gas sector, the United States has both economic and strategic interests in maximizing energy security, not to have a repeat of the 1970s. Uh, and um, I don't care uh, who, whatever party occupies the White House and Congress in the coming decades, uh, energy security for both economic and policy reasons, economic and strategic reasons will be important to the United States. And so I think, uh, I, very good question. Go read Jack Mintz's chapter in our book for a, a, a good answer. It's always a good answer when you can refer to the book that you have on sale. Fantastic, Dr. Morton. Uh, so we have another question. It's from a former board member of the club, Mr. Roy Goodall. Um, as an Albertan and a Calgarian, I share your economic and representational concerns at both the federal and provincial level. As a Calgarian, I believe we are underrepresented in the legislature. We send too much money to our provincial government and receive too little in return. What to, our, to our provincial government? To the provincial government. I think he's speaking to the sort of urban rural uh, displacement and also in, in, inside Alberta. Yeah, inside Alberta. And um, what are your views on the creation of independent city states within Alberta? Uh, I, I assume he's also, he's a trying to talk about the concept of city charters, which this, the current government sort of put to the side for the moment. Yeah. Are you uh, charters and how could that solve our issues? It, I mean, it's a good question. It's an inter interesting question. Uh, again, the economic basis of this province has shifted uh, in, a, in a significant way from uh, rural agricultural and forestry interest uh, to oil and gas, urban interest, uh, financial interest, services, and so forth. Um, I, I think the answer is, again, if you look at the, uh, the changes in reapportionment, the distribution of seats between urban and rural Alberta, uh, every time we do that, I think it's every decade, uh, the number of rural seats goes down. And if you look at the size of the rural districts in Alberta now, uh, they're huge, uh, not easy to represent. Uh, so I think uh, the electoral system has reflected the demographic and economic changes that the question raises and, and does so in a way that is um, sat satisfactory, I think, to most people. We have a question that came out of the uh, chat from uh, David Sheriff Yadley. Um, in 1982, Pierre Trudeau and the provincial premiers did have a chance to modernize the constitution. Why did that not happen with eight conservative premiers representing the provinces? Why did, did that not, oh, why, why, why did we stick? Why, why did we stick with it? Why hasn't there been a continuity of reform through the constitution? Well, if you, if, again, I would urge people to go to the, go to the book, and particularly my chapter, 
I, I try to highlight uh, the, uh, all of the victories that uh, Premier Peter Lougheed won in the negotiations in 1980 and 81. Uh, the notwithstanding clause, Peter Lougheed gets credit for that. Section 92A, uh, Section 92A, which is a reaffirmation of each province's, but of course this is particularly important for Alberta and Saskatchewan, each province's right to develop uh, and, 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 and maintain their natural resources. Section 92A, it makes, it makes explicit what was already implicit in the, in the old constitution, and it was a direct response to the national energy policy. The belief, certainly in Edmonton, uh, Saskatoon, again, and remember Saskatchewan was an NDP government in those days, and uh, Premier Blakeney, uh, that this would protect Western Canada from another NEP. Fast forward to literally today, there are lawyers from Saskatchewan uh, and Alberta in Ottawa today in front of the Supreme Court arguing that, the car that Trudeau's carbon tax uh, violates Section 92A. Uh, and the Alberta Court of Appeal, the, the case that was raised and came out of Alberta, agreed with that, that the whole point of 92A was not to allow the federal government to, in effect, directly or indirectly govern uh, resource development within the province. So those, there were a lot of important uh, constitutional changes, maybe 92A the most important, that law he'd won, but now have been reversed in what's happened over the last uh, 30 years by, by judicial interpretation and or federal practice. And again, as all the papers and all the news reports are reporting, there's a lot of attention being paid today to one, how that court case, how the Supreme Court rules on the carbon tax, and also, of course, what uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's new green plan does or doesn't do for Western Canada and the energy sector. That feeds wonderfully into this next question by uh, Alan Offenberger. Um, he writes, there's a problem with more Alberta independence from Ottawa in the current, especially future times. How do, does one cope with the inevitable decline in the use of fossil fuels and therefore the economic underpinning of the province? It seems to me a single Western province do well relying on national, natural resources. It may be more effective to negotiate new arrangements as a collective, BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So uh, how does one cope with the decline in use and uh, uh, the economic impact of having uh, the, the economic underpinning of the province of, through natural resources? If I understand the question, I would concede right away that a, a separate Alberta is more vulnerable to the problems the question raises than a a, a Buffalo, a Western Canada of BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, again, because of the greater diversity and size uh, that that would bring to the economy. In terms of, in terms of um, uh, economic diversification in coming decades with the inevitable decline of oil and gas, I'd say two things. Uh, one, <coughs> I think economies can uh, deal with gradual decline of one sector but rather than an abrupt decline. What we're in right now is a decline that a complete collapse since 2015 the, the, uh, and the election of Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. That has, as I said, created economic devastation and job losses and home losses, everything that goes with that in Canada, in, Al in Alberta and, and Saskatchewan. At the same time, places like North Dakota, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Texas are prospering because there's still the demand there. Um, over time, uh, will renewables and alternative fuels gradually displace uh, hydrocarbons? I, I think they will. Uh, I think, but again, Western Can Alberta, but even more so Western Canada is well placed to do that. BC, of course, is a hydro superpower. So matching BC's hydro superpower with Saskatchewan and Alberta's hydrocarbon power is, is, is a good mix. Um, so again, I think over time that issue can be addressed and it would be addressed more effectively with what some people have called the Buffalo, a, a Western, a Western Canadian Republic or what, I don't know whether it'd be a Republic or still a, a, a crown, <laughs> still the British, uh, part of the British system, but the broader, a more divert, a broader, larger, more diversified economy, I think addresses those issues. So Dr. Martin, we're going to lead out with 
two last questions. Okay. Uh, one is coming from uh, Susan Jolliffe, uh, our speaker's chair. Um, thank you. That, I forgot to thank Susan and Sally for helping to organize this. So They're pretty amazing. Uh, they are the straw that stirs the drink. None of this happens without them. And you just remember to listen to them, Vincent. <laughs> so um, her question, and I'm, I'm going to slightly adjust it. Um, so right now, uh, there is a political discourse surrounding a conflict between Alberta and environmentalists of both an international and local nature and it being fundamentally based on this you know, oppositional politics. Uh, one element of this has come out with the, can the Canadian Energy Centre and the uh, panel that's currently being led by uh, Mr. Steve Allen uh, looking to uh, foreign influences coming from various environmental efforts. Um, so with that context and with that work going on, how do we best deal with the concerns of environmentalists both at home, both at home and abroad? I'm getting phone calls while I'm trying to listen to you. I apologize that I didn't have that off. Um, that's a, a really important question, a really good question. I think more one that I have, I don't have enough time to answer. There was a column, I think, either in the Weekend Herald or yesterday's Herald, um, co-authored, I'm going to forget who the co-authors are, that talked about the synergy between, uh, between renewables and hydrocarbons. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get that to you and you can email it out to uh, uh, all of the participants. And But I think the key point of that Sue makes, or is asking, or Sue's question raises, and which is addressed in, in uh, addressed in the uh, in the uh, piece in, in the Calgary Herald, is that if we cool down the rhetoric, if we cool down the rhetoric between the renewables, climate change people, and the uh, hardcore oil and gas, there's again room for cooperation and for transition over the coming two decades. Um, and I think there is a middle ground there. Uh, I think Susan obviously uh, sees that, and I think uh, it, it exists, uh, but it requires uh, cooler heads and, and perhaps a uh, more moderate type of rhetoric than uh, we've seen. And I'm gonna remind, remind me afterwards to send you the piece so that it can get out to all of your, uh, all of your, uh, all of today's uh, participants. Fantastic. We'll also be circulating around uh, the uh, the editorial you had posted in the financial uh, post. So um, I'm going to lead off with uh, finish off with this last question. We're going over time just a smidgen. Um, so it's been uh, so the National Energy Program happened about 10 years before I was born, um, but it's been about 40 years since that program, and since well, we've had multiple governments since then, uh, you know, blue ones, red ones, uh, you know, uh, various hues and colors, uh, each of them have not followed through with having a national energy strategy, doesn't have to be an NEP, it could be anything else, of some form to not only advocate but support and uh, further the interests of the energy sector and the broader, you know, context of, you know, the importance that rely on it uh, for the last 40 years. Why has there been a consistent struggle for that method, approach, and support to occur at the national stage? In other words, why, why has there been a policy void? Uh, in yeah, that why has there been this void? Okay, again, probably a good answer would require more time. But I think, I think, in part because the jurisdiction, the the, author, the legal authority to develop resources, uh, is clearly uh, divided uh, explicitly, particularly since 90, Section 92A was put in the Constitution. Thanks again to Peter Lougheed. The primary jurisdiction responsibility rests with the provinces, but of course, uh, federal government, Ottawa, has responsibility to uh, to regulate and to govern trade and commerce, uh, section 91.2, right, of the Constitution. 
And the two overlap because obviously oil and gas is involved in trade. So there's overlapping jurisdiction. So there's, let's just say a real opportunity for conflict. And I would say this, for the first decade or maybe even two decades after the NEP, the NEP kind of um, froze opportunity for cooperation because of the distrust that it created in, in Edmonton and in Regina. Uh, just, it, it kind of poisoned the well and there was very little interest in sharing or doing anything with Ottawa. So that, that would explain maybe 20 years of no national energy. And then in the last decade or so, of course, we have the intersection of significant growth in Western Canadian oil and gas at the same time that the climate change and carbon emissions have emerged as a major issue. And again, those two are, uh, if not in, in conflict, they're in tension with one another. Any reasonable person would, would concede that. And again, as I said right at the beginning, if Ontario and Quebec had significant oil and gas reserves, uh, I think the conflict would have not even arisen or would have been resolved in a way that was equitable for all regions. But of course, not only, well, of course, ironically, Quebec does have natural gas, but they don't want to develop it because it would reduce their equalization payments. But I digress. I apologize for that. Um, but also- The best tangents are, are the ones- in That's exactly. Kind of tangents. But, but Quebec, is a, Quebec is a hydro superpower. Again, partly because, of course, it has stolen Newfoundland's hydro. Again, I digress. I apologize for that. But, and so, again, when I used to teach federalism and environment, uh, Quebec was the bad boy of Canadian environmentalism because of all of its old outdated pulp and paper mills that polluted all the rivers uh, and all of its hydro dams. Now, of course, all with all the focus on climate change and emissions, uh, Quebec is kind of the golden boy of Canada because hydroelectricity is clean. Hydroelectricity is not completely clean. It has other problems, but anyhow, the, the, the shoe has shifted. And again, I think it has been in the self-interest of the Liberal Party and Justin Trudeau specifically to exploit those differences to try to win uh, majority governments, which he's done once and came close a second time. And who knows what we're going to see. Uh, well, stay tuned for the throne speech this afternoon, right? Well, I think it's happening right now. Uh, <laughs> well, then we better get off. <laughs> uh, German. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Okay, well, thanks everyone for attending. The event is officially over. Um, but before everyone leaves, as intern president, I'd like to give a few important thank yous and details about our next speaker. Well, first and foremost, thank you to our speaker, Dr. Ted Morton. Thank you for giving us an uh, eye-opening talk about the fact that we need to look at our path right now. And thank you to everyone on the, our board our, in our committee who've been key in making this happen today. In particular, an honorable mention to Vincent St. Pierre, our membership com committee chair, who is being on technical lead today, including Susan Jolly and uh, Sally Lewis, speakers, committee co chairs. Please join us for our next event, which is on October 14th at 1130 on Zoom. For a noted public speaker named author um, Ruben Nelson, who would talk about Act Like an Owner and Citizen's Guide to Struggle for the Future. This should be a great topic and a very poignant topic going forward. And thank you again for your support and thank you for attending. Be kind, keep safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Ted. Yep. Thank, thank all of you. Goodbye. Thank you, Vincent. So an email will be circulated with a survey, those two articles and uh, uh, various other bits. Uh, if you'd like further updates and to stay in touch with the Canadian Club of Calgary, we also have an email list that we send out an email every two weeks. And like us on Facebook, follow us on LinkedIn, add us on Twitter, we're on all the social media platforms, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.